Well, today, I guess we pick up where we left off. We're still discussing the male body. And now we're going into the female body. The problems involved in the female body that make it difficult for the male to realize what's going on when we are married, especially in the household life. The female body is designed for tactile reaction more than the male body because of the constant contact with children. The mother is always cuddling the child to her. Therefore, the female body has to have more tactual experiences. The sense of touch is more developed in the female body than the male body. But sometimes we don't even notice it. We take it for granted. Well, you have, for instance, the child hurts its leg. And the first thing you do is rub it. You say, come, mother, rub it for you. It'll be all right. And when the mother rubs it, the child feels OK, and it goes and play again. The tactual contact being so closely related to the mother and the child is carried over constantly in the body. Because when we live so close to each other, we lose this tactile contact. The male body wants tactile contact. It wants to generate the tactile contact. But what interferes with the male body is the, the daily stress that the male body is confronting. The only way the male body and the female body can release this stress is by massage. Now, when the husband and wife are going up together in the first marriage, this is often felt, but very little of it is done. They need to massage each other. As they grow on, and they have their children, and the children growing up and going away, that feeling is no longer there. Yet, inwardly, the feeling is crying out for contact for this particular reaction. We tend to feel afraid to touch the other person lest there is a reaction. When in reality, that is where the body needs more tactile contact by massage. The fact that it is contacting the other person by touch Subtle forces are being transmitted between the male body and the female body. Massage is an art by itself. Sometimes to massage someone can change the whole feeling from love to a feel of disgust. Because in a massage, 
it's not how much you rub that breaks the pressure, but it's the way the motions are brought into action or brought into expression on the body that releases the pressure. If you do this, after a while the individual gets bored with it because there is no, it, there's what is called a peak point of stimulation then it tapers off and becomes an irritation. They become irritable because it is no longer something of release. It brings up the tension. Now, when you place the finger on the body and apply the pressure and by rotating clockwise and moving along the body, this now causes the release. To get the feel of that sensation. Well, let's test it so we can understand it. You begin to feel now using the chubby part of the fingertip. Don't put too much pressure, but just... Huh? <laughs> Go in a clockwise action, but never rub it this way, because it builds up a heat and then it tapers off. In this area, you don't build the heat up. You're actually setting circles of motion throughout the body. Now, the first area in the male body that is very sensitive is around the neck. That is why the, the male loves to be massaged around the neck. Because if you do that, it takes the stress off the head. Now the female body is the same. It takes the stress off their neck. But the female body gets more stress relief from around the neck. In the male body, more stress is released from the shoulder, this part here. Well, let's demonstrate it. If somebody want to come up? And let's turn around. The male body is here. Okay. Next. The female body is here. here is different. See the difference? You want to try it on somebody now? Well, Come and I'll show you, so you'll get the feeling that you can do it to somebody next to you. Try it.
somehow on the, the nail body you work it here. Female body you work it here. Which part was the source? Yeah, that's the female body. Okay. Okay. This is where you work on the male body. See, watch my finger and see the pressure. You don't lift the finger, you just rotate it. That's on the male body. On the female body, See the difference? The female body, this feels much like, I feel like the female body. See, let them feel the difference when you try on the male body here. Right. And in the female body, it hurts here, and it don't hurt here. Right. That's right. Female body, the head part is symbolically like the ovum, therefore the neck of the female body is more sensitive to stress. Now the male body, because it's a sperm penetrating and it's secreted by the male body, therefore the impact cushions and therefore all the stress is left down in the shoulder blade. So when the sperm hits, there's a recoil action. And that recoil action leaves the stress. So even though we are not banging our heads symbolically or physically into objects, but we are banging our head into psychological problems every day, the male body is constantly cushioning the effect around the shoulder. That's why they tighten up more here. And a woman tends to tighten up here with the headache in the upper part, not around the shoulder blade. So once you realize the structure and the effect of the shock, how the shock is tapering itself off or carrying itself off from the body, then you must use the correct tactual contact and motion to release it. They, you want to move it that way. Now, first you work with the head on the tactual release. Then we come to now the spine. It's going right away down into the part where the, the most tactual forces are located up within the sex region. Because the energy has to rise up back and make contact in the brain. And it's contacting with the uh, medulla. Now the medulla of every human being has the same amount of stress. But that little indent in the back of the head is equal. Both male and female, the stress is equal. Now, in that part, you can massage the you know, same way. Thumb. And you get a good brace 
fact that you're always like that if you're going to write or type the sedentary action and the bouncing is sending so much recoil action right back to the medulla before you know it then the eyes start to get tired then huh? uh, fatiguing yes it's the constant bouncing up and down now if you're driving in an automobile over the years of my own experience, it is not wise to drive two, three hours steady and then change it and let another person drive. You're going to be tired far more at the end of the trip and you feel very listless. And you release too much lactic acid into the blood and you force the heart to work too hard. It is better that if you're driving with someone to alternate every hour. Even if you can just stretch yourself out completely straight out for the other hour while the other person is driving, bounce it up. If you can just lean, that blood flow back and the bounce back of the automobile bouncing would tend to send the blood now on an evil field back into the spine. And he had an experience going up to Callahan come back. The, the same thing you notice if you alternate because the body would correct itself more than steady driving all at one time and building up the stress. If you have another person driving, once you alternate every hour and you just relax yourself, you find that the blood flow will correct itself and the recoil action will taper off. And by holding the hand back and let the head rest fairly good in the thumb. You know, it's like a, you're holding it up. And then just rest where the big finger can go the full length. It should be the full length of the, like that. Really 
like I'm holding up my head. Okay? Like a fish hook. Just like a hook. Being hooked up in that point there. And holding it. And then working it. How you work it? You take out all the sweat from you. And that area to do. Not it. You're coming down the spine. Along the spine, the pressure is building up. And we want to release the stress from it. So, to release the stress from the spine, there are four primary techniques. And there are about nearly six or seven secondary ones. We're not to concern the secondary ones, concern the primary one. The primary technique of preparing the hands. A good tactile therapist, you know him as a masseur. As a tactile therapist is one who has to develop their hands just like a musician. Just to have nice, soft, delicate hands with tremendous strength in the joints. That's why you practice for that. Every day you give yourself little exercises like that. So train the fingers that they don't bend. And you tap on the meaty part of the finger. Because you're going to need that type of action to control the, the flow, the, the energy. And getting the finger to spread. Try it. It's like stretching it out as far as you can stretch back. Like you're pushing against an invisible ball or something. These exercises strengthen the tactile flow. Now you can do this and strengthen it by pushing against the fist. Now, the next one is the knuckle. You're going to need them, and I'll demonstrate it for you. You find that as you press against the fingers, they start. Some are weak and some are strong. The weak ones, you have to work on them till they feel they they lost that sensation of uh, semi pain or. <laughs> so you pull it back, and as far as you can without hurt, without hurting it, and let's see where the hurt. Work out the hurts. Some of them do hurt, right? Well, you work them with the thumb pressing back like that till you get out the hurt. That means that it's learning to adjust to those pressure. It's supposed to do this five minutes a day. This is what they call your, your tactual therapy technique.
Okay. Here's the model you'd have to learn now. You hold the hand. Is that in the indentation here? Yeah, in the indentation on the rotator. You'll need it when I show it the exercise when when it comes to put it perform it. You'll need, you'll know this. You'll understand what it does. <laughs> now we have one we do the feet because a good tactile therapist uses feet too. You can straighten out your spine and uh, stretch your back muscles with our feet. And they do have what is called foot massage. Not somebody massage, but by, with the foot instead of your hand. They walk on your spine. Exercising your own body, preparing it for uh, the tactile uh, side alone that limbers you up, that alone that you're applying it alone. <laughs> okay. Now, the primary number one movement is this way, all the time. Now you have to learn to do them individually. Hmm? Practice it. <laughs> Here is where you're going to work on the, the feet. So, on your own feet or on the opposite partner's feet, you work around the kneecaps. And you go like individual fingers. Shifting the stress from one finger to the next finger, the next finger, the next finger, the final finger. Start again back in the thumb, forefinger, middle finger, ring finger, middle finger. Now then you start working up. You always start from the kneecap. You see this little bone here? Well, you... muscles to relax because in modern society we are driving cars in a primitive society we have to walk so they don't centers that are magnetic forces. 
That's where we come back to your spine. So, sir, constant sacrum, sacrum, dorsal, lumbar. Uh -huh. These are vertices or the magnetic field. They're right there in front of you. And you're always walking in it because it's around you. So, the man, the best healers, you'll always find them the Rotam Tami. Right. Yeah, the best healers that you find, they walk like this. Oh, so the energies come in the solar plexus. Yeah. Do, do, do you ever see a good healer who is a tremendous healer or a famous healer who can really heal? He walks just like if he's ready to like a, like a, a crouch. Because the energy pulls them that way. It's magnetic energy. What is the shape of our body? Uh, very that's not it. Very uh, oh, she very she She's more she's rotund. She's, she's the lands on hand, which most of the ones that lay on She does she lay on hand. She said the magnetism, you don't have to lay your hands on the magnetism is there once it starts flowing, it's flowing. That's all, it's the magnetism. That's the magnetism flowing. Now, we're covering the, the massage point. We have the rotation, the tapping. The knuckle or pressure and the chop. These are the four basic ones you'll be always using. Rotation, percussion, rotation, tap, pressure. Now, there are certain areas of the body and they're called the 20 body parts the 20 body part technique by knowing the 20 body parts you can perform the massage of uh, using any one of the four technique or uh, contact to release the stress in the male body or in the female body and the 20 body parts begin with the head first The shoulder, biceps, forearm, the wrist, the chest, back part, yeah. shoulder blade, around it, yeah. here, the buttocks, the groin, the side. Kneecap, calf, foot. These are the body parts. By working on them, now, certain body parts respond to certain uh, techniques better than others. For instance, along the spine, punching with the nail responds the highest. Then comes the pressure by the knuckle. Then comes the tapping. And last is the rotation. So you don't get as much effect on the spine by rotating. As much as when you tap it, or you punch it, or you put the pressure. There are more in the, in the inner movement of the kneecap, to the groin. This is no good. There is no stimulation. But this is stimulation. Because you have a lateral muscle that you can hold and rotate. Because it pulls the muscle to the whole muscle. Along 
the fleshy part of the slide here. See the fleshy part here? The best technique for that is pitching. Sole of the feet, a couple of the palm. You realize that you have to strain your hand to stretch back. That's why you need it. So it cups into that area. releases the stress to all the cells because in scratching you by rubbing the finger like a scratch you are setting up ultrasonic waves along the line you see that Thank <laughs> you. 
Punching with the nail or tapping, then the knuckle, then the chop, then the cupping of the hand, and then the pinching, and then the scratch. Now, there is one more, but you have to be very careful with it. And that is the back and forth action of friction because it has a tendency to shorten itself out. That is, it builds up heat, but then when the heat is built up, it cuts out sensation. You have to be able to rub it and then stop so as soon as you feel the heat not to continue beyond a certain sense and let the heat do the work. See the difference? If you rub it, and as soon as the heat starts, then you take it off and let the heat do the work. But if you rub it and rub it and then the heat is building up, the heat itself will cut off and then there's no sensation there in the world. You just have to rub it and then let the heat carry through. That's what they call, that's why you use a brisk towel. And it's best after a bath to take a rough towel and rub with a good nap. And take it in sec don't go all the way like that. Take it in section. And lift, take off in second, and just get the heat to build up. My little pockets of heat, and they, because they have little pockets of heat, they will dissipate into each other. Then the whole body will be glowing. Uh, the blood comes to the surface of the skin, and it stays there, and it's the vitality and the zest, the feeling of the cells, are in a higher state of potency or strength. And it's good to have it after all that. It's dry. And then it tends to push off. It reaches what we call a tolerance point. That's why you find between the male and the female, the daily embrace tends to, after a while, taper off. Because it's a dry contact. There is no emulsion or lubricant contact between the male and the female. It's when you have a lubricant or emulsion contact that the cells are kept in a higher level of potency and yearning for each other. 
and the vibratory nature of love is heightened. If you take cream and you rub it on your face after a while, women have that, they do that most of themselves. What is the sensation? Yeah, as you apply in the cream, huh? Don't, uh, women are the ones who use more creams on their skin, right? Now, the sensation of rubbing cream on the skin is very, very stimulating because the cells are soft and pliable. It has a glassy effect. It tends to stimulate. So when the oils are used now throughout the entire body to massage it, it makes the cells more vibrant. And that feeling of joy or bliss is increased. And the body does not tire. That's why the early Greeks and Romans and Orientals used to go into their baths with scented oils. And the, the scented oil tend to increase the sensation of the tactile massage. Because that's what it's supposed to do that you would take the bath or you massage the body with the oil so that the body itself now has a higher reaction to feeling and contact and then the stress is released quicker because the pores are absorbing the oil or the cream and the best oil for a massage is still an olive oil because it will go right into the blood if you just rub it on the surface it passes right through in that case, you said you could actually feed the body, right? Yes, with olive oil. It's what you call uh, osmotic uh, therapy by massage. You nourish the body with a normal poly and saturated effect of the oil. And you automatically, by massage, reduce your weight by olive oil. Learn a new thing today, huh? Well, I'm <laughs> weight reduction can be brought on by osmotic uh, absorption of olive oil through massage because it will go in and work on that uh, heavy cholesterol fat in the skin and those layers of the epidermis and break them down by the heat and the massage from the external nature where sometimes you can't drink it enough but it will go right through because this is its normal action it goes in right into the system it's the only oil that has that peculiar ability to olive oil to pass right through but it has to be pure olive oil not uh, hydronated by heat you don't want the olive oil that is being fired by heat it must be pure cold pressed out natural olive oil and that oil will go right into the body when used in this case, you said it would put with camphor in it, and it helps break down and it helps to <coughs> Yes, if you use camphor, it'll do that. Now, also, if you use uh, eucalyptus while you're rubbing it, it will clean out the, the lungs, especially those in smoke. It'll start to the inhaling of the eucalyptus will start releasing the stress, the tension built up from the uh, nicotine and smoke it. Rub it on the chest. Rub it on the chest. No, no, no. Just think of osmosis. Would it work if you took a bath and a brine solution and cause the water to draw the toxins out of your body? Yes, uh, they have brine solution uh, baths. You do that. Would that be as good as a sauna? Yes, but we, we are not coming to that yet. We are you're jumping the gun. We are trying to go step by step in this process to understand what we are doing. There's no sense trying to jump one before the other. We are dealing first with oils. We are dealing with water, but we have the different types of water. First we dealt with hot water and cold. And we dealt with the carbonated water. We didn't deal with the minerals in the water. We are dealing now with oils. If you run into minerals in the water before, they're fine, then you don't, you don't understand what the body is for. Minerals in the water are designed for illness. <coughs> Their composition is designed primarily for illness. They're not designed for a healthy body. 
you don't use them on a healthy body. You can swim in salt water. This is okay. But there's a way to use salt on the body that will clean the body in case of illness or prevent illness. So we are not dealing with that right now. We want to understand how the compatibility between the male and the female body is maintained in the household effect or life so that it gives them that understanding of why the male or the female have these conflicts and what can be done to relieve these conflicts. That the body is a living mechanism and it must be nourished by different ways to maintain balance so that the, the rhythms that the body is so subjected to would not tend to turn off individuals against themselves or one another. If you find yourself being turned off from your husband or your wife because the body's rhythms are predominant due to the, the moon's activity in you and you don't know what to do then you get into fits and anger and before you know it you want to bite your finger, you want to smoke or you want to drink, you want to eat more food. Just an ego gets to be the part. We want to understand why this is happening so that we can now observe and carry it into our daily life. That we can ease the stress of the daily living with the other person. Now, the Eastern philosophers all say familiarity breeds contempt. But familiarity is an indication of tolerance levels. You can't have familiarity without a tolerance level. Every object in this world has a tolerance level. That's a level to which it reaches and it's taken for granted. So for what is familiarity? It's something you take for granted. There is no more sense of strangeness. So your sense of strangeness keeps balance to some degree. That's why in the ancient time you had the the master lived in one room and the wife lived in another room and the perennial courtship was always going on. The moment they, they threw away the extra bed and they got into the one bed, the other like uh, going hunting. Challenge. Any new challenge or competition. This is the way the male body gets released. In competition or challenge, in group activity or trying to go off into areas and uh, find some type of association with the environment that would free it from conflict camouflaging itself. which is not a very practical way. You see, camouflaging is not a, a good idea to free the stress. It's better to face the stress. So this society today where you have more and more complex and uh, subtle approaches to conflict or conquest or uh, uh, aggressive actions. Yes. And you have more camouflage. Right, way. right. So camouflaging has a tendency of building up neurosis. That's the danger of the camouflaging. You see, men either ran or fought or was subjugated or dominated from primitive time up to civilized time as a dominant life form in the male body. The male body always did this to survive, to react. And if it couldn't react because the opposing force was stronger, it took to flight. If it took to flight and it was not fast enough, it was caught and dominated. If it was strong enough to retaliate against the opposing force, it became tyrannical. If when it took to flight and it avoided capture, by ingenuity it resorted then to camouflaging. 
So it was the only way it knew how to survive. So the greater the camouflaging, the greater the tendency to become neurotic. You see? Because sooner or later you run out of camouflages. Right, it's on right, this is it. So if you turn around and face and come back to a point of overcoming the situation, then it breaks that pattern. So the stress is released. That's why Yukteswar said, don't run, face every problem and it will cease to bother you. He was actually trying to stimulate the survival pattern which is built into the sperm already to accomplish. How does ginseng, how does ginseng affect this? The ginseng uh, root uh, stimulates the, the, the gonad action and makes the individual feel more virile so that he can shut off the feeling of impotency or the feeling of inferiority. Now, the impotency is brought on, as I said yesterday or the day before, by certain conditions of not facing up and therefore the tendency to be blocked off. Now, any sensation that depletes, depletes the virility or any condition that depletes the virility of the, the individual drive tends to produce this impotency. Ginseng is just a natural root or a natural herb action that stimulates that virility action. It's equivalent to vitamin E. But in vitamin E, it's the anti-sterile vitamin. So vitamin E would make the man be more of a, a greater donor and the sperm would have a higher motility action Ginseng would not do that. Ginseng would give him the sense of bravery or the sense of uh, capability to handle himself, which is a, a heightened virility. Does it affect though, your conscious ability to control your uh, adrenaline or aggressive? Yes, it would control the adrenaline in the aggressive nature. The ginseng would do that. But you have Adriatica hydrocotyl, which is a better herb for that because it has a tendency to rebuild the, the connective tissues. It, the Adriatica hydrocotyl, which is a better herb, does rebuild the connective tissues. Now, there is another herb. which the elephant eats. This herb gives a greater staying power to face problems. It's an anti-stress herb. Right now the name it eludes me. I can see it right on top of my shelf on the, in, the, uh, in the herb shop there, but the name is... I have it up in the herb shop. No, not barrage. So these are other ways as well. Yes, it builds up stamina and anti-stress. You, you eat them, herbs. the herbs. Well, we we're, we're gonna come into that later on. What are the necessary foods that build 
at the stress in the body. But there is one that is I, I have there right now, I just got to recall the name. I know it's a long big name. And there's a funny thing, I had the green plants growing here. They brought them from India. They sell they even sold them here in uh, Thailand. For two dollars a plant, then you grow it and eat one leaf a day. And the name is eluding me right now. When I go up to the shop, I'll look at them. But it's a plant that uh, you can eat. It's very good for the willpower. Uh, Yeah. Yes, it controls it by will. It's in the food itself. <coughs> you, eat, you eat it like a herb, and you, it builds up the chemical action that will help you to control the stress that the body is subject to. I've heard, I've heard it, it's saying that it's I have heard that ginseng did that. Ginseng did, does that, but uh, it's different than ginseng. The ginseng is a root, and you have to uh, put it, uh, soak it into al alcohol to get the effect of the ginseng or grind it. Whereas uh, the auto herb is a natural herb growing, and you can eat one leaf a day to get the effect. Isn't that like taking tranquilizers or something? No, this is not a not tranquilizer. This is a natural herb that the body, just like a rosemary or thyme, it's a natural food. It's a food itself. It's a food supplement. It has a certain element that you can't find in other foods. It's a basic food supplement. The elephant eats it. It's food that they feed the elephant on. And it grows mainly in uh, India and uh, Ceylon. And they bring it into this country now to grow. And they're using it as a food supplement. They're growing it to make food supplements with it. So you can't get all the minerals in your food from the basic food that you're eating. There are certain minerals that we're deficient in. Like the trace minerals, you don't have them. Great deal have to be brought up to the ground. And the plant kingdom is the only kingdom that can seem to absorb them properly and transfer it to us without affecting it in a detrimental way. come to that part yet. This is a whole series going right through. Yeah? You're taking each stage what is involved in the individual, why he is doing it. In the first place, if you don't know what you are and why you're involved in the marriage and uh, why the individual is trying to have offspring and why he's trying to avoid it, you have to go back into the mentality of the individual to find why he's avoiding offspring, why he's avoiding certain conditions, and what are the factors involved in it. So how can you jump too fast when you, you don't build up the right uh, structure to understand it? So you have to go gradually understanding why your body behaves a certain way, how you release those stress so that you come to a norm, to behave at a norm. And then you take on the responsibility of marriage to function in that norm. And what are the complex conditions that threaten the norm? 
If you jump that too fast, then you don't know what is the norm in marriage. So you're going to say now that the norm, the contraceptive is not a norm. The contraceptive is a threat to the norm. It is a, a way in which the norm has been shifted from one ethical value to another ethical value. The norm is that the male or the female does have offspring. Now, when you shift from that ethical value, then you have to real, uh, realize what factors cause them to shift to want to use a contraceptive. Well, you, we come back to the very first thing we're talking about. That was the start of the whole process. Of all the five forces in the human body, the hardest one to overcome is lust. Ego you can overcome, but lust is very hard. But the lust is not brought on as a norm. It's brought on by an abnorm. It's brought on by factors that the body cannot throw off. It's brought on by environmental pressures that cause this abnorm to exist. Until we can understand how it built up itself into an abnorm, we are never able to control it. Man can control lust if he understands how it is constructed. But if he doesn't understand how it is constructed, then he's a victim of the pressures that make him lustful. This is not within his mechanism. As he's not born lustful, but he's born with the, the drive of the lust from parental thought patterns that are locked into his stream of existence and by the nutritional balance and environmental pressure that would tend to stimulate the lust. Until we can correct that or understand that, then we can control it. It will still be there. So, go ahead. When we use the word lust, we are referring to an action outside of the married life with your partner. That is an action outside of that. It's not lust. There is no lust between a married couple. There's no lust between a married couple? This is a norm accepted behavior between two individuals on a mutual consent basis by man, woman, and society. How they interact. When the man has taken the woman onto himself and the two have become one flesh, there is no lust. What if you don't want to have children? Then you got to go back prior to marriage. What is the cause that he doesn't have that? We have to understand that. That's the norm of that. But if you're not trying to have children in marriage, if you're not trying to have children in marriage and you're having sex, is that lust? I did not say it was. Yeah, I don't know what you said or not. I'm trying to understand it. I said the action that occurs between a male and a female in marriage has nothing to do with lust. This is a commitment you've made already. You made this commitment when you were married to each other. This is a commitment you made to each other when you got married. But isn't the ideal state in marriage not to have sexual relationships? Mystical state, the idea, the ideal state of by conserving the energy for meditation and whatnot. That's what Master says, that's what Margaret says, that's what you about it. The act of sex was designed or procreation is designed for producing children. But you think by any stroke of nature, the very first act of sex produces it? Even by a married couple? The chances for a successful ovulation in a female, even in marriage couple, by the very first act of sex, are rare. You know that? <laughs> 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 
Huh? Most people found out the opposite, it seems like. The chances are rare. Then the chances can happen, depending on the what period it happens in the individual. You see, you have a, a, a condition that exists in the male and female situation when they're married. Well, we were told by more than one person that the, you know, the state to reach is never to have sex unless you're trying to have children. That's the, that's the, you know, like, purest state for a mystic to be in. In other words, no sexual relationships for any other reason than as the desire to have children. We cannot discuss that to the benefit of others unless we understand what is what we're talking about today why it is not an ideal state to overindulge in it until we learn the next lecture we covered something today that's going to show us why you bring up a question why the masters are talking you only do it for the procreation of another species it has absolutely nothing to do with that. The reason why the masters are talking of not having the act if it's not going to produce the human being, because it is what is involved in the formation of those fluids and the time span they are formed and when they are secreted without the purpose of bringing them to a completion what the body goes through Physiologic. physiologically speaking what the body you, you notice something uh, we're jumping ahead of the lecture because that's tomorrow Come. Here in the gonad area where the formation of it, it's a direct link back to your medulla oblongata. This is the medulla oblongata right here, and the, the spinal cord runs right down here and then connects to the heart area, then connects down into the endocrine system and then right down into the gonad and the testes where it's been formed. These fluids are formed here. Now, where is the fluid trapping? What is it? What is this particular organ trapping? Do you realize what it's trapping? To build up a sperm? It's trapping secretion from the brain. Brain cells. They travel down via the medulla to be to be stored up here to form it, and equally through the ovum. I have diagrams of this to show you in detail how it's trapped and brought down. But I can't jump ahead until you understand why the, the factors in your life are leading to to be abnormal. The act of sex is the least condition. It is the formation of the things that go on inside that make. The, the no no by the masters. You are actually secreting brain cells that are trapped and built up to shape that form. Every doctor knows that. So you're like wasting your brain cells. You are, yes, to a certain extent. Throwing away valuable brain cells through a release. But if they're down here, right? Yeah? You're always throwing something away. Yeah, but not brain cells. Adonis? You're never throwing it, it's always reabsorbed. The only way it can leave your body is via the organs of the sexual rhythm. If you have the uh, brain cells stored in the gonads, are you having any good use from them if they're down there anyway? I mean, is there any harm in using them? If there's, there, the, every day in 24 hours, you are secreting them down your spinal cord right down into that area. It's going right down and be stored up. And it takes three months to form the sperm in the male body from the precipitation of the brain cell. And the amount of brain cells that have to come down to build up 
in one ounce of secretion, not approximately uh, three or four thousand sperm in one ounce of secretion. Now, it takes about three months to build that up. Your body cannot build it faster than that. There is no way your human body can build up that or store cells in the form of the sperm in the human body and rest necessary now for release. Now, your cell salts are built around that principle already. We haven't come to all that because we can't, you can't jump into it unless you understand. And you, the woman's body is going through the same thing. Hers is changing in every 28 days. Her brain cells are drawn down faster from her body every 28 days to build up the ovum because the ovum also utilizes brain cells. When I bring the chart down and draw it out and show you how the, from the medulla oblongata everything goes right back into the regenerative organs. There is a direct link all the way through that every doctor will tell you that the act of procreation is merely a mental I impression. The feeling is a mental impression that actually it, we don't have no sex life unless we are stimulated by the mind because the conditions are formed by brain cells. There would be no craving if we were never stimulated there are substances that are deposited there, secreted out from the brain. So the brain has a lot to do with it. Now the reason why the master is talking that it should only be used for the offspring because other masters are being born or higher intellect are born is because if you degenerate the body, you have a degenerate brain and a degenerate circuitry formed to pull in a lower entity of a lower caliber of consciousness. If you hold your consciousness at a higher level, then you attract an entity of a higher consciousness. So the personal discipline on the physical body becomes important. Otherwise a master would not emphasize that. He knows definitely that brain cells are being lost in the discharge of the energy. See, that's the only reason. Now, sublimation of the act is reversal of precipitated brain cells that are stored in the lower regions now that must be pulled up by paraphysical methods to reabsorb itself back into the brain. So you can bring it back up. Well, that's what the technical sublimation is. We'll, we, we'll cover all that. You asked for a tremendous uh, session. We haven't begun to throw the book at you yet. You couldn't even take it. And I don't even think we'll uh, ever cover all of it uh, in this session. Because there's a whole lot to the being a man or being a woman, let alone trying to live a household of life. The household of life is taking into consideration every aspect of creation. You can't uh, just uh, up and jump each phase because it is involving our existence, our survival, our economics, our association with each other, and the, the continuation, uh, continuation of the species. The whole soul of life is involved with that. So we have to know how we are constructed. We have to know how these forces are precipitating down in the body. We have to understand how we can waste them and what we actually are wasting. What we are actually wasting is precipitated brain cells. And the brain cells carry all the data inside of this particular makeup. You see, the early disciplines that they lay down on the individual were not laid down just for to thwart the individual or make him uh, into some type of uh, individual that has no feeling and live some sort of a restricted life. 
within the married life, it is accepted and understood that it's not possible that in one activity there can be a new offspring. It may take many, it may, not, it may even take one. But this is accepted in that particular arrangement because there is no sense of guilt during the activity with the married person. Outside of it, there is always these two forces, violence or guilt. You see, there is the condition. That's why we are using forces that are formed out of the brain. And when we apply certain attitudes to release these forces formed out of the brain, electrically, we create a distortion and the result can be tragic in the individual's life or in the offspring's life. So they have seen too many of these things on the inner plane. You know that premature release by the male body leaves electrical forms of unfinished 